Isn't that amazing? That's my retirement plan, by the way. Uh, I'm going to work for Legos and just build Lego things. Each week, we've been showing a time-lapse Lego build. This is the eighth week, so I promise you guys that's the last one, okay? I'm, I'm tired of them, too. But that's a pretty darn cool uh, uh, example of thousands of Legos that come together and, and make something appear to be something it's not. I mean, that's a Ford car. It's a size of a Ford car. It's absolutely amazing. These, these blocks are a great symbol of what our values do and how they function for us. We've been talking about our core values at Stewart Congregation Church for eight Sundays now. This is the last one. And uh, our values function like building blocks that shape our identity and empower our mission and our vision. So this last core value, that last building block that we're focusing on today is the value of service, not serve us. Difference makers for others. Now, in the life of the church, generally in America, there is this thing called the 80-20 rule or 80-20 principle. And it, it works out like this. 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work. And so for 20% of you, this is a core value that you're already embodying, that you're already living out. This is something that is just, you're like, you resonate with. The problem is that this value is for all of us. And that's why it's so important for us to focus on service, not serve us. As I said, it empowers our mission. What's our mission? Again, you should have it memorized by now, to follow Christ and share his grace, to follow Christ and share his grace. A, 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 a second grader could remember that. And it is so simple, yet it, it includes everything about our lives to do it. And our vision, which our values promote and inform and empower, is the preferred outcome that we believe God wants for you, me, and all people. What is it? Our vision is individuals, families, and communities thriving in God's grace. How do we get there? How do we follow Christ and share His grace? By living out our values individually as Christ followers and as a family of faith. So, in order to get at this, I want to go back to the picture of the Lego car. What a cool car. I mean, if you didn't know better, you'd look at that and think they're just looking at a car on a car lot. A regular old car on a car lot. But what we see is a car that does nothing. It's nothing but Legos. It's really beautiful but it's not functional whatsoever, maybe, maybe as a paperweight. And the sad thing is there are a lot of churches in America that reflect that very thing. Look really good on the outside, but don't do anything substantial. A lot of churches that are big on form and low on function, big on appearances, low on impact, big on looking good, low on doing good. And, and we don't have that luxury because... Jesus tells us we don't. You see, God designed the church to be more like a hospital than a country club. You go to a country club, if you've ever been to a country club, you know, you expect to be served, you expect to be served nice things and catered to and so on and so forth. Go to a hospital, you see everyone who's working there from volunteers to the staff to the doctors and nurses, serving others, helping others. They exist to help others. That's what the church is designed to be like. God designed the church to impact others for good rather than to be served. So when we gather for worship as we are now, when we gather for Bible study, when we gather for fellowship events, for all kinds of programmatic stuff, we are rightly seeking to be filled and nourished spiritually, but it doesn't stop there. We are filled spiritually in order to pour out the love of Christ. That's the natural flow. That's the way it's meant to function. We are blessed and we seek God's blessing in order to be a blessing to others. And we see the way this works out. There's actually a progression in scripture that I want to point out. It starts with the body of Christ. We serve each other. We serve each other. Listen, there is no need in your life that you go through physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, relationally, Uh, financially, that you should go through alone. God designed us to walk with one another, to care for one another, to hold one another, to pray for one another, to carry each other's burdens. This is God's design for the church. And and you heard when Tara and Stephen were up here, and I gave them the towel of servanthood, 
This is not my idea, by the way. This is Jesus. He said it. Let me repeat that text again from John 13 that is on our towel of servanthood. He said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet, each other's feet. He's talking about disciples, the church. I've set you an example that you should do to one another as I've done to you. So it starts here. We serve one another, but it doesn't stay here. Because out of that overflow of serving one another, being nurtured and cared for by one another, we are able to then serve others. That's the second flow that the Bible teaches. We serve others outside of these walls. Formally through our ministries and informally through all of our relationships, all of our influences, where you work, where you go to school, where you eat, where you shop, everywhere you go, in your neighborhood. This is the way Peter puts it. And you can see both the internal serving and the external serving represented in the way Peter puts it in chapter 4. He says this, Above all, love each other, the body of Christ, the church, love each other deeply because love love covers a multitude of sins. It sure does. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I love that he puts without grumbling in there. People are just people, guys. They always have been. Each of you should use whatever you've given. Here's the transition. Use whatever gift you have received to serve others. You see, we've just gone from inside the church to outside, serving others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things... God may be praised, not us, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful, one? and and that little paragraph, it tells us so very much. But very simply, it says we serve others. We serve each other, we serve others. And the result is the third step that I want to point out. And this is really very special. Because you remember the words that Jesus described Himself by when He said, I am the light of the world. He's talking about himself. I am the light of the world. It should be humbling and amazing that Jesus then turns around and he calls you and me as his followers, as the church, the light of the world. He equates us by what we do serving others with himself. And so we are the light of the world. How? Through our good deeds. Through our serving each other and others. We become the light of Jesus for one another and for others. This is the way you put it in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world, period. It's amazing. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, again, others outside the church that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That they may see your good deeds. That's how we become the light of the world. Now, why is this, why is this important? I, I want to I illustrate something in a picture. Um, because, you see, what often happens in the life of the church is we come and we receive as well we should. We want to be fed spiritually as well we should. We come to Bible study. We want to learn and grow as well we should. But if there's only inflow and no outflow, we are at risk spiritually. You may have never even thought of it that way, but we are at risk. It's a lot like the Dead Sea in Israel. If you've ever been to Israel, you've likely been to visit the Dead Sea. And it's called the Dead Sea for a good reason. It has a lot of water flowing into it, but no outflow. As a result, it has 33% salinity. Now, compare that to the Atlantic Ocean, which is 3%. And because it has so much salt, you can literally float on top without any flotation device. That's, that's a real picture. No flotation device under him. I've done that, actually. And it's so salty that no fish live in it. There's no plant life. It is dead. Why? Why? A lot of water flowing into it, nothing flowing out. You and I have to have an outflow. God pours into us. You're here so that you might be built up, equipped, inspired, so that you can serve, so that I can serve. Every one of us, not just 20% of us. So let's unpack it a little bit. Why serve 
others. Let's look at what Jesus says, what the Bible says. Why impact others? Why is this so stinking important? I remind you, I didn't come up with all this. This is God's idea for the church, for you and for me. And the very first reason is the most important reason. Why serve others? Because God's word and Jesus mandate it. The sermon really could stop right there. God's word and Jesus mandate it. You see, the church, the local church and the church universal is not man's creation. It's not ours. It's Jesus's church. He is the head of the church and the Lord of the church, not me as the pastor, not you as the congregation, not the church council, not some denomination or somebody somewhere. The Bible, the Bible is our constitution, not our bylaws, not committee minutes, not our good ideas. The Bible is the authority. Jesus is the Lord and the head of the church. In other words, we take our marching orders for who to be and what to do from one, Jesus. One Lord, one master. I love, it's a great way of illustrating this. Uh, I heard this story about Emily Gloria Wilson, who was the housekeeper to an economist whose name was John Kenneth Galbraith. And uh, Kenneth Galbraith was apparently uh, an associate uh, to Lyndon B. Johnson, President Johnson. And um, one day, Emily, his housekeeper, was told by Kenneth, listen, I'm going to take a nap. I don't want anyone to bother me while I'm taking a nap. And so he takes his nap. In the middle of his nap, President Johnson calls him to consult about some economic stuff. And his housekeeper, Emily, says, well, I'm sorry, sir, but he's taking a nap, and I have, I have you know, instructions that he should not be uh, awakened. To which President Johnson says, well, I'm the president. Go wake him up. I want to talk to him. To which she says, no, Mr. President, I work for him, not you. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? True story. It goes later that evening when he gets back a hold of Kenneth Galbraith. He tells a story of what his housekeeper said. And he said, that woman is so faithful and loyal to you. I want her in the White House. What did she do? What did she model? She was loyal to one voice, one person only. And that's a great, great illustration for you and me when it comes to why we serve God's word and Jesus mandated. We serve one master, one Lord, one voice only. So let's talk about another reason, though, another good reason. And this has a lot to do with looking around in our community. Why we serve is because our community desperately needs the blessing of our service. Guys, we live in a hurting world, and it starts outside these doors. We don't have to go far at all, do we? We know that through our formal ministries and through our informal influence, that visits are made to people in the hospital, both in the church, people in the church, and outside the church. That, that home, the homebound, people who are homebound and who can't get out, are cared for, who are prayed for, are loved on. There's pastoral care for dying people. There is Stephen ministry for people that are, are distressed or going through transitions and difficulties. Uh, people that can't get out and do much, write cards, make phone calls, bake a casserole for people who've been sick. There's help and hope for struggling families, our children's ministry and our youth ministry, our vital lifelines for families. Uh, we have tutoring for Hispanic children through our homework angels. And so fam the, the future of a generation is being empowered through this kind of tutoring. Through our active caring and compassion. In other words, the homeless are given food and clothing. Why? Because we collect food and clothing and give it to them every week. Through our active caring and compassion, marriages are rescued. I see it often. Families are empowered. The sick and dying are given dignity and honor, and they're not left alone. The young and the old are educated together. I love when we come together for our midweek Bible studies and I see all the generations learning and growing together. We see that lonely people find friendship. There are so many lonely people. You can be alone in a crowd, can't you? And this is the place for us to find that kind of friendship. We know that poor children receive backpack supplies, school supplies, Christmas gifts. Why? Because some of the formal ministries that we implement 
our community desperately needs the blessing of our service, both in our formal ministries and in the way that we serve them in our relationships. That's an important reason. Let me give you a third reason why we serve others. This one may surprise you. You see, your spiritual growth and my spiritual growth depend on serving others. Your spiritual growth and my spiritual growth depend. In other words, when we do not let out what we have taken in, we're limiting our growth. Our culture, you see, bends us in that direction. Our egos bend us in the direction of serving ourselves instead of serving others. We like to have it your way, don't we? We like drive throughs and fast food, and we like things to be easy for us and our schedule, and, and, and maybe if it fits into our schedule, but probably not. We often think of the church a lot like a luxury hotel. My wife travels a lot, and she tells me the stories of these luxury hotels she goes to that I'll never go to. <laughs> Pity me. And, and we think of the church a lot like, you know, they have these, you know, some places they have these big fluffy bathrobes, like, wow. And, um, and they'll have these little sculpted uh, towels, you know, little animal sculptures. There's a picture of some swans. Yeah. Um, they even have these little signs you put on the door that say, do not disturb. You know that sometimes we come to church with a, unconsciously, with a do not disturb sign around our necks? You do. So do I. Because we don't want our comfort level to be disturbed. We don't want what we're used to, what we have always known, our little routine. We just kind of come and check the box off. And we really have a do not disturb sign around our necks. We don't want to be asked to go to Bible study or to reach out in any new way, any different way than we're used to. You see, it's a lot like this anonymous quote. I don't know who said this, but it's spot on. Most people wish to serve God, but in an advisory capacity only. <laughs> It's so true. But I want to say this, because you and I have a lot of personal preferences. If I ask what you do or don't like about something that's going on in the life of the church, I'll get as many different answers as there are ones of us in the room. And this is something that we all have to hear. In the church, personal preference, whatever it is for, whatever it's about, is not a substitute for biblical precedent. Let me say it again. Personal preference does not substitute biblical precedent. That's why we have to preach and teach on this. That's why we have to discern what God's Word tells us and what Jesus mandates for us. Let me give you a couple of examples. Acts chapter 1, Jesus' final words. He says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. He's giving these last words to the church. And what's cool about what he's saying is this, that when we serve others, which is what being a witness is, we're not doing it out of our own feelings, our own disposition, our own power, but it's his strength, his power, his spirit that is engineering this, fueling this. And here's the good bad news. He doesn't give us an option, guys. He doesn't say, you can be my witnesses if you want to. If it's a good day for you, why don't you think about being my witnesses? He doesn't say that. You will be my witnesses. It's an emphatic, a declarative grammatical form. You will be my witnesses. And Peter, Peter unpacks this in, in the, 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 chapter, the verses we just read. I'll read verse 10 in Peter chapter 4, Peter chapter 4. He says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. See, that's the Holy Spirit coming to gift us as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now here's what's cool about that one little verse. God gave you spiritual gifts to use for others. Every single believer is, given, is endowed and empowered with spiritual gifts given by God, not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of others. The way it works, guys, if we're serving one another, we all get served, right? Through the power of God. And here's what happens. You administer God's grace by serving others. It's not just doing good. You're not just a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout helping someone across the street. As good as that is, you're actually administering the very powerful grace of God. God is using you. And here's the corollary. You grow in grace by serving with your spiritual gifts. There's, th this is a primary way for you to grow in the grace of God by implementing, using putting to work your gifts by serving others. Now, the opposite is true too. 
A part of you withers and dies spiritually when you neglect to serve others with your spiritual gifts. Think about the Dead Sea. Everything coming in, nothing going out. Or maybe we can think about this was a wife, and sometimes we can be like her. Uh, her husband was quite ill, and uh, they went to the doctor. He had a, uh, a, a severe mystery illness, and the doctor uh, said he wanted to meet with her alone, apart from the husband. And she told him, you know, he, her, that he has a, a severe form of anemia, and it's treatable, and he will live, but only if she does certain things. If she doesn't do these things precisely, he will die within a few weeks. She said, okay, well, what do I need to do? He said, well, his immune system is compromised, so the, your house needs to be kept up with every day, spick and span, not a shred of dust, dirt, everything in order. This is physical, this is psychological for him. And he needs a lot of calories, he needs hearty food, you need to, you need to make hot meals three times a day. Baked goods would be good on top of that, lots of baked goods, and the children have to be utterly quiet. It has to be total peace in the household, all these things have to be met. He will die in a few weeks if you don't do these things, but he will live if you do them. Now, he said to her, would you like me to break the news to him? She said, no, 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 I'll do it. And so she approached her husband with tears streaming down her cheeks. What did the doctor tell you, honey? She said, the doctor said, you're going to die very soon. <laughs> as funny as that is, sometimes we are like that in the life of the church. And so we need to serve others because our spiritual growth, our spiritual life, and the lives of others depends on it. Here's the fourth reason why we serve others. We serve and love Jesus when we serve and love others. We serve and love Jesus by serving and loving others. You see, often we, oftentimes we, we separate sort of our spiritual life with Jesus over here, and then our life with others over here. That's not the way it works. That's not biblical. Everything about your encounter with others has to do with your encounter with Jesus. Jesus makes it clear that we should see others as himself. One of my favorite prayers I heard one time in a soup kitchen line, the team was gathered to serve people who were coming through, homeless people coming through to eat a meal. And as the team gathered, looking at this line that is developing to be served, this was the prayer one lady offered. She said, Lord, help us to see you in that line today. Amen. That was her prayer. That was so spot on. Because God wants you and me to see him in one another and in others. Yes, even the hard people to love. The hard people to like. And when we serve and love others in Jesus' name, here's what's so cool. They get served and loved by Jesus through us. You see, the table gets turned, and they experience Christ. You know, you might, you've heard this before, you might be the only Jesus in the flesh someone gets to encounter. You might be the only Bible they actually ever read. God wants to use you. Jesus works, that's why we're called the body of Christ. Not just in the church, but in the world. I heard a story about new believers in China. China has a huge underground growing church. And in some places, when a new convert comes to the faith in China, they, they have this saying. Now, if you are a, a stickler for grammar, you have to excuse this. It's being translated from Chinese. Obviously, it has dangling prepositions. So excuse that. But here's what they say to the newcomers in the church, the new believers. Jesus now has a new pair of eyes to see with, new ears to listen with, new hands to help with, and a new heart to love others with. Isn't that beautiful? That's the case today with Stephen and Tara and with every single one of us. Jesus uses your eyes, your ears, your hands, and your heart to touch others, to serve others. He wants to work through you and through me. But you and I have to have a willing spirit to give ourselves to service in his name. One of the best books I've read about this is, uh, maybe you've read it, it's a really inspiring book by Rick Warren called The Purpose Driven Life. And, and, and it's a great, great reminder of what we're talking about. Rick Warren said, serving is the opposite of our natural inclination. We've already said that, haven't we? He said, most of, most of the time we're more interested in serve us than service. And he went on to write, we say, I'm looking for a church that meets my needs and blesses me, not... 
I'm looking for a place to serve and be a blessing. Stewart Congregational Church, my friends, is a place to serve and be a blessing. Yes, you get served, and yes, you get blessed in order to serve and be a blessing. Are you with me? This is God's design. This is not mine. And that's why it's so important. Let's talk about one final reason why it's so important to serve. And this, is, this represents a cultural change that we've been through in the last 30 years in our country in particular. We must earn the right to be heard. Just because we have a church building, a steeple with a cross, a pastor, and all the accoutrements of church, you know, you know how far that goes with the people that live around us and in our community? Zero. Goose egg. We, we are no longer credible to our neighbors and to our culture any longer. There was a day when I was growing up, and uh, in the decade before I was born, where it was the natural thing where people came to church. But there are a whole lot more people right now sitting in their apartments and condos all around our church, sipping on their coffee and reading the morning paper than are here. Why? Well, our culture has been conditioned, haven't they? Conditioned negatively by money-grabbing televangelists and fake faith healers and hypocrisy in the church both in very loud and obvious forms and in person-to-person relationships. And so people are carrying baggage. People are carrying a lot of baggage associated with their negative, bad experiences in the life of the church. And guess what? We get to help them unpack it. How? By loving them and serving them. That's our opportunity. Not that we have to, but we get to by God's design. Well, what are we talking about with this whole series with all of our values and with this value of service, not serve us? What we're talking about is a shift in perspective. Maybe there's some things that have been said this morning that that are challenging your perspective. Uh, Have you ever seen the picture of the old young lady? Who do you see here? If you see the old lady, raise your hand. If you see the young lady, raise your hand. Yeah, See, the whole face of the old lady, the chin at the bottom, or the young lady with her head tilted to the right and her jawline exposed. The point being that you can see either one, but you have to shift your perspective. It's possible for you to do, isn't it? You can go from one to the other. You and I are not stuck in how to be the church just because it's always been one way. We are called, mandated in fact, to shift our perspective. We can see things differently. We are shifting, in other words, from building walls to building bridges with our community. We are shifting, in other words, from measuring attendance to measuring impact. We're shifting, in other words, from attending a service to being equipped for service. We're shifting from serve us to service. And listen, when we begin to implement these values for ourselves personally and as a congregation, it, it requires something that is one of the most difficult things in human existence. You know what it is? It's, it's one word, ch- ch- change. Change is so hard for us, isn't it? I don't like to change. I don't like, like what's going on with my mid-50s body. It's changing and I don't like it. Do you? Yeah, I don't like what changes happen in our families and in our culture. And change is so hard. We fight against it. We resist it. And it's no different in the life of the church. But guess what? Jesus said, I didn't say it. Jesus said, you got to change. In, in fact, here's the key. He said this in Matthew chapter 18. He said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just any kind of change. He, and we talked about this last week, if you were here. Change like, why would he say change to be like little children? Because they're malleable. They're adaptable. They're teachable. They're learning. They're forming. We adults have a big problem, and that is we get stuck in this is the way I am, always have been, and always will be. And Jesus says, guys, that's not an option. You need to change 
like little children. And there's a key there that gets you into the kingdom of heaven. There's a key that allows us to serve others and not just ourselves, to be difference makers for others. But change is hard. God gives us the assurance that through His power, we can change and we can be difference makers for others. Amen? Jen is going to play a song now. It's a great song by Tracy Chapman. It's simply called Change. And I want to ask you, as she sings it, and as you see all of our values that we have talked about for the last eight weeks, scroll through the screen. I would simply ask you that you use this time as a time of prayer to ask Jesus, Lord, what is it you need to change in me? What is it you need to change through me? Because your word tells me this is the way we're designed. And you'll give me the power and the gifts to do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we hear this song.
Heavenly Father, it is by your strength and power that we make any change. Change us from the inside out to be your children and to follow you, but through following you to serve you by loving and serving others. We ask that you would give us children's hearts, a childlike faith, so that we might not seek our personal preference but the biblical precedent, the mandate given to us by Jesus and by your word. Empower us to be difference makers for others. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we worship. so many things in this world that um, that we think, I need more of that. I could use more money. I could use more stuff. I could use more time. I could use a lot of more things, right? But this song this morning is just a great reminder that the one thing that we absolutely positively need more of is Him. And so let this song just be a stir in your heart, a prayer this morning, a cry out to Him. Just say, God, I need you more today. Let's sing that out together. need you more, more than yesterday.
only words can say. 